Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody back to the Trans Lesson Plan, your go-to podcast for transgender history. As always, I'm your host, Mark, and it is an absolute pleasure to be back here with you all today on this lovely Sunday. Happy first day of Atlanta Black Pride. Now, as we celebrate this week, for all those who will be in Atlanta or live in Atlanta and will be attending some sort of black gay event, um, I just want to say have a good time. Please be safe. And always make sure that you're doing things within your limits. I've been at Atlanta Black Pride for seven, eight years now, and we know how to have a good time. So I just want to try to be safe and, you know, know your limits, be around people who love and will take care of you in case things do go awry, you know, just as a heads up. But uh, I will be out busy in the city of Atlanta. So if you ever, if you do see me, you listen to the podcast and you never met me before, or even if you have, and you still want to just, you know, chat with me about the podcast, got questions or whatever. Uh, I will be at the major events that you could possibly think of as it relates to global black pride. Um, same thing when it goes to the parties too, as well, I will be there. So if you see me, you never met me before, you do just say, hey, I'm nice, very sweet, I promise. Um, and I would like to get your feedback if you got any. Um, it means a lot to me to have some type of criticism or feedback about the podcast as I get more and more in depth with this platform. So um, yeah, so just enjoy yourself, have a good time and party with your black gay selves, right? Uh, we are family, so I, I don't want y'all to think that um, you should have a good time at, a, at an event this big, especially in Atlanta. Um, so, yeah, enjoy yourselves. Uh, let's see. Do I want to give any other advice or anything like that? Um, this episode will come out as it usually does on Sunday. I will have, I believe, two more before I go on vacation. And technically, season seven will be starting after vacation. So it kind of works out. Um, so everything should be going according to plan. I already got my episodes planned out. So you all will still be getting these episodes for the next couple of Sundays, even though I will be busy this entire week. <laughs> uh, four, five events, five parties, two birthdays is what my schedule is looking like for the next seven days. So this is why I plan accordingly before I uh, go out into the streets of Atlanta. So they, the schedule is still the same coming up, everybody, just to get your heads up. All right. To get into today's episode, before I begin, I would like to shout out all of my listeners. If you are brand new here to the podcast, I would like to give you a grand welcome to the Trans Lesson Plan. Uh, just to give you a general synopsis of this podcast, it's not just about history. It serves as a platform for education. Provide you with valuable insights into the transgender history and also the community as well. My job is to aim to inspire understanding, promote inclusivity, and spark conversations about our community as well with this expert knowledge and resources for further learning. Each episode of our podcast is intentionally designed to be concise yet comprehensive with a duration of about 15 to 20 minutes. So, you know, give you something to start with, get your brain going. And then you can learn more along the way. So all these podcasts is really just a very broad synopsis of the topic that I discuss. And I want you all to continue that work at your own time and pace. If you ever are interested in a particular topic that you may have heard of or you may not have heard of, it's totally up to you. But um, that's my job as a educator slash historian in a way, you know. So, yeah, welcome. To all my returning listeners. Thank you so much for continuing to support the podcast. You mean so much to me because y'all are consistent with it. As I look at my analytics and stuff, you know, I, I get the same amount of count or like I said, it goes up every every other time I post the episode. So progress, you know, everybody. Woo woo. Um, you know, I just appreciate my return listeners for leaving good reviews, for continuing to support and listen. 
um, you know, it, it just means a lot to me. Uh, consistency. From when I began this in COVID, stopped because of other things, and then come back into it, it means a lot to me. So thank you all so much. All right. With that, let's get into today's episode. So today we'll be diving into the life and legacy of Dr. Harry Benjamin, which I did mention last episode, actually. When I looked at my queue of topics that I had, I didn't know that it was right after the Reed Erickson's, um, Reed Erickson episode. So it kind of worked out. So, <laughs> so Dr. Harry Benjamin is a trailblazer, actually, in treasure and history. His groundbreaking work in treasure and medicine has left a lasting impact that transcends his era. So today we'll be exploring his life, his significant contributions to treasure and to healthcare, and his enduring influence on the visibility and understanding of transgender issues. So let's get into it. Dr. Harry Benjamin, born in Berlin in 1885, emerged as a prominent German-born American endocrinologist and sexologist. His medical journey began at the University of, and let me say this right because y'all know I do not like to say things incorrectly. It's not a name, it's just the name of the university. Uh, it is in German, so I'm going to do my best. Let me get my Google Translate up real quick. All right, here we go, here we go. Tübingen. This is in German, too, by the way. So if I was saying that wrong to all my German listeners, I'm so sorry. Where he completed his studies in 1912. Now, from the outset, uh, Benjamin had actually a keen interest in the science of technology and his friendship with our dear friend Magnus Hirschfeld a pioneer advocate for LGBTQ plus rights and a director at the Institute for Sexual Science, played a significant role in shaping his perspectives on gender and sexuality. I have done an episode on Magnus Hirschfeld. You can check that out. It's a couple of seasons ago, I believe. Um, but I did a whole episode on him and the impact that he has had in advocate for LGBTQ plus rights and um, the science of sexuality as well, just to get your heads up. Initially, Benjamin focused on geriatrics and hormone treatments, but his career trajectory actually took a decisive turn when he relocated to the United States. You know, arriving in New York in 1913, he established a thriving medical practice, bringing his European expertise to the American medical landscape and earning widespread respect for his innovative approaches. By the 1940s, Benjamin found himself spending summers in San Francisco, and in 1949, he encountered his first transgender patient, igniting really his lifelong passion for transgender medicine. Now, at that time, the U.S. medical community offered little support to transgender individuals in terms of hormone treatments or surgeries. Yet, Benjamin drawing inspiration from German traditions and his uh, experiences with Hirschfeld embraced a more empathetic approach that prioritized the needs of transgender individuals and approach that was actually very revolutionary for that particular era. Like I said, let's think about this when we think about the 1940s and really what it was doing for the LGBTQ plus community. Not really much at all. Honestly, little to none. Um, his work gained significant momentum in, 19, in the 1950s, uh, especially after Christine Georgeson's uh, transsexual surgery in Denmark uh, capture really that global attention, right? Although he didn't coin the term transsexual, Benjamin played a pivotal role in popularizing it, which is why technically you don't hear me say like transgender surgery, transsexual surgery, uh, using more like the historical contents to uh, this particular discussion I'm having right now. Um, he prescribed hormones and facilitated surgeries for numerous early transgender individuals, becoming really a beacon of hope within an often unwelcoming medical environment. Now, his ability to listen attentively and learn from his patients set him apart, uh, you know, really from his uh, contemporaries, right? So you all may have heard of, I think I, I pronounce it WPATH, but I'm sure I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, to be completely honest with you. Um, but the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, uh, WPATH, was established to really advance the understanding and treatment of gender dysphoria and related medical conditions. It was actually originally founded in the 1970s, named after Harry Benjamin as the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association, HBIGDA. 
Soon, W. Path was named in honor of Dr. Harry Benjamin, a pioneering figure, obviously, in transgender medicine. And the organization sought to develop uh, professional standards of care for transgender individuals and foster collaboration among healthcare professionals from their uh, various disciplines, including medicine, mental health, and social work. Now, before I continue on about W. Path, um, I do want to note that if you ever, ever want to make sure that you're going to um, a particular professional, depending on the discipline, whether it's medicine, mental health, and social work, highly recommend going to W. Path. Um, it is an amazing website. It gives you a location and where you can look for services in the state that you reside. And these individuals are obviously board certified and all that good stuff. Um, but like I said, this tailors strictly to transgender health. So if you want to make sure that you're getting with someone who is uh, obviously professional, obviously works with transgender patients, obviously has a little bit more knowledge than the average doctor may have, depending on your insurance, how do you recommend going there, checking out the list, and then kind of narrowing down who you want to go to, and et cetera, just to get your heads up. Um, 10 out of 10 recommend. That's how I found a couple of my um, my practitioners and professionals for kind of things that I want to get handled for myself. Recommend. Now, WPLAF has played a crucial role in the development and dissemination of the standards of care, which provides guidelines for the safe and effective treatment of transgender individuals. And these standards have evolved over time, reflecting advances in clinical research and growing understanding of the diverse needs of the transgender community. Now, this organization does continue to advocate for the rights and well being for transgender individuals, as I just mentioned because they actually promote evidence-based practices and encourage global dialogue on transgender health issues. So, like I said, definitely check that out at any time. Now, in 1966, Dr. Benjamin published The Transsexual Phenomenon, which some of you may be aware of, may have read too also as well. which is a seminal and groundbreaking work that made significant contributions to the understanding of gender identity. Now, this important book distinguished transsexuals who seek to live as a gender that's different from the one that they were assigned at birth. Uh, the terminology which you may hear, which is obviously completely outdated, I like to consider it to be a derogatory term. Uh, but transvestites, which you will see probably uh, within the, the book as well, just to get your heads up, are those individuals who technically wear clothing associated with a different gender uh, for various reasons. And then, of course, it's going from homosexuals as well, whose sexual orientation involves sex uh, attraction to the same sex. So this book is really going and distinguishing and dividing up the three different terminologies of transsexuals, transvestites, and then homosexuals, right? Just to help the general public, quote unquote, get a better understanding of the transgender community. Like I said, this is back in the day. These terminologies obviously are outdated. We do not use these anymore. So when I say these into the podcast, I'm not saying it to be derogatory or rude to my own community. It's just to give the historical context to it. Now, Dr. Benjamin's work advocated for medical intervention specifically tailored to the unique needs and experiences of transgender individuals, including hormone therapy and surgeries, to help them align their physical bodies with their gender identity. And this influential book quickly became a cornerstone, really, for both medical professionals and researchers seeking to better understand and care for transgender individuals. It served as an essential guide for those professionals aiming to provide compassionate and informed health care and support. And additionally, for transgender individuals themselves, the book represented really a source of understanding and support during a time when they were really often marginalized and misunderstood by society. It provided our community really with validation and a sense of community in the world that frequently did not recognize and respect our slash their identities. Now, as I mentioned, the book as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Benjamin's advancements in um, transgender medicine too as well. Uh, as I mentioned, he laid really the foundation for transgender health care by, like I said, prioritizing patient-centered care and respecting of individuals' identities along sale, uh, along sale, alongside Magnus Hirschfeld as well. I already said they kind of go hand in hand. Um, while some of these you know, contemporary critics view the original standards uh, as somewhat kind of um, – paternalistic, right? Benjamin's approach was actually pioneering for its time. Like I said, he paved the way uh, for uh, 
for the advancements in transgender healthcare initiated essential conversations about gender identity that persist today. And his legacy is characterized by passion, understanding, and advocacy for our marginalized community. So to note, Dr. Benjamin's enduring legacy is reflected really in his organization now listed as WPATH. Um, that his work, like I said, elevate the suffering of many transgender individuals and foster a more inclusive world that we see today. And what, and like I said, on the advancements in a lot of the things that we've got done, not a lot of things that we got done, but a lot of the medical advancements for all of us, the, the millions of us who identify as trans now, also non-binary and et cetera, to get the health care that we absolutely deserve. Um, like I said, his influence extends beyond the medical field. It also pulls into the shaping of societal attitudes and championing transgender rights really on a global scale, not just a national scale. So his legacy is a profound statement, I mean, testament to courage, empathy, and an unwavering drive for better care for those who are often marginalized and overlooked by society. And through his pioneer, pioneer efforts and dedication, Dr. Benjamin not only revolutionized the field of transgender health care, but also instilled a sense of hope and possibility for countless individuals to what we see today. So his groundbreaker work continues to inspire and pave the way for future advancements, encouraging new generations of healthcare professionals to embrace inclusivity and compassion in their practice, ensuring that transgender individuals receive the care and respect that they deserve. Now, crazy thing is, Dr. Benjamin passed away in 1986, so that man was 101. He was 101 years old. Uh, so when you think about almost 100 years of pioneering for transgender health care and medicine and to continue on his legacy in this history today, we have to give him his flowers. We have to do it. Um, so rest in peace to Dr. Benjamin. Thank you so much for all the work that you do the inspiration and the guidance to the medical field that we see today. So to wrap up, that is our episode on Dr. Harry Benjamin. Highly recommend looking at his biographies um, on the Transgender Archives of Victoria. Out History has one as well. I think USC also has one in their one archives. Uh, so if you can find any more information on that, definitely take a look. The Transsexual Phenomena, I think, has limited copies still out to where you can buy, maybe like on eBay or something. If you really want to have a, a physical copy of that, um, I will have to check. I can check that real quick which for y'all to tell y'all where y'all can maybe possibly get the book <laughs> if you are interested in buying one. Um, Transreads.org actually has a copy of it. Free PDF version. You can read it any time. Amazon also does have it, have it, but I will tell you right now, they're trying to charge $5,000 for the book. Do not recommend. Transreads.org. <laughs> Go to transreads.org. You can get the PDF or you can download it, read it at your own time. <laughs> Just to get your heads up. Um, but with that, thank you all so much for listening to today's episode. I thoroughly appreciate you all for tuning in. Uh, if you have not done so already, please like, subscribe, follow, or whatever social media platform that you do have to keep up with the Transessive Plan. Get the notifications. Uh, tell a friend, family member, ally, acquaintance, whoever about the podcast. Um, let them know that this is here for them as a free resource to the general public to learn more about transgender history as well. You can follow us on social media at the Transessive Plan on Instagram. And also on Twitter, if you want to follow me, the host Mari, you can follow me at Mari World uh, on Instagram, M-A-R three I's W-R-L-D. And like I just said, enjoy Atlanta Black Pride if you are in the city. Uh, like I said, be safe. New episode will drop next week. Yes. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your weekend. And um you know, I'm gonna have I'm gonna go have a good time, y'all. I'm gonna go have a good time. So I'll see y'all next week. Peace.